you gents, what'll it be? Whiskey straight. Uh, just a vodka for me. Take a beer. It's what I used to forget about. The war. I the war. Yeah, the war. See, the war. The war? Oh, the war. I was a young nationalist and a part of the also volunteer force, which was basically your average after school club. Except me lads and I would spend our days roaming the streets and looking for nationalist maggots to rough up. We were so zealous that even till we never met any of those bastards, I didn't even care. So you can imagine my excitement when we got wind of a nationalist meeting going on in our own neighbourhood. And who do I see when I banged on the door but me own brother, Patrick? Okay. <laughs> he just sat there staring at me till I dragged him back to our dad and mum. You didn't know, mum. We need to pass the third home rule bill. We need our own parliament in Dublin. Catholics need rights. You are a Catholic! I am, Mom, and I would like you to accept my life decisions. I kept on right with the boys in the militia, and with my heavy heart, continued my crusade. Patrick left our village a few nights later, and we knew he was keeping up with the Irish volunteers. Shows were the worst moments of my life. We were brother against brother, but I had to go on for king and country. I heard rumours of a civil war between Unionists and Nationalists. That business at Sarajevo was the only thing that stopped, saved me from my war with my own twin brother. Britain called for my service in August 1914 when she entered the Great War against Germany. The Home Rule Bill was pushed back because of the war, so I thought it was safe to leave and take a break from my vigilante work. My fellow patriots, the Ulster Volunteer Force, enlisted in the 36th Ulster Division. 200,000 Irishmen served in Great Britain's army. We fought valiantly, and our division equaled any of the greats in history, capturing the German base of Schwaspin Redoubt and fighting the Battle of Albert. Little did I know, my Australian twin brother had also joined the war to defend Irish, to defend Catholic Belgium. He spent most of the war on bloody, brutal Western Front. And I was lucky to escape with his life at Swam and Hullunch, where many of his comrades were gassed. And that's a fight I wouldn't meet on me a worst enemy, even those lousy Germans. Meanwhile, me mum and dad had to deal with the Easter Rising in April 1916. When a group of Irish nationalists seized Dublin and 2,000 people died or were injured. Roger Casement, a rebellion leader, hoped Germany would arm them to fight Britain. I'm glad he was executed for treason. The next time I saw Patrick was during the spring offensive in 1918 in northern France and Belgium. It was also the last time I saw him. On May 7th, 1918, he died in my arms. So many of my fellow Irishmen died during the Spring Offensive that there was a conscription crisis and Britain attempted to impose a draft law. Going home disillusioned with the war, I sought revenge. I joined the IRA to force Britain to its knees for killing Patrick. I wanted independence and we got it in 1912 with the Anglo-Irish Treaty, establishing a free state in the state of Ireland. We got a whiskey, thanks, vodka, and beer. Can I test me Cormac, it sounds like a real kick in the teeth, you know? Losing your brother and all. But uh, some people had it worse, you know? Uh, I've heard poodles that have had it worse than you, so toughen up. If those are fighting words, say it to me, Fist! Boys, 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 calm down. There's no need to fight. What would my abuelita say if she saw us here today? Three grown men, war-weary and tired. We need to connect, we need to bond. Let me tell you about my time in the war. The war. Mm, the war.
Back in the time of the war, I was living with my abuelita, Francesca Jimenez de Martinez Gonzalez, in the city of Catalonia. Within España, the people's views were extremely varied. Although we were technically neutral, the beliefs of the people definitely were not. The wealthy supported the central powers, but I, along with the other middle-class nationalists, sympathized with the allied powers. Sometimes these tensions and built-up political strife caused by the war were so destructive that they led to major workers and labor union strikes. Down with the German scum! Allies forever! <laughs> During the war, the hostility within our country reached new heights. <laughs> My father was a firm supporter of the Allies and was all but kicked out of church one day when the pro-German priest found out. The people's opinions were not the only ones that weren't neutral. The government also had a certain disposition. Our country supported France and the other allies with the exportation of goods during the war. Since we were technically and officially neutral, we didn't directly participate in combat, but we did intervene occasionally in order to help with the prisoners of war. Thanks to Alfonso XIII, su majestad, España would become notorious for easing the suffering caused by World War I. When I turned 23, my life changed forever. My cousin decided that he would fight for his beliefs regardless of what our government thought was correct. He joined the French Foreign Legion. Our abuelita was devastated. Ay Dios mío, she cried as she shed a single lonely tear. Many hombres from Catalonia joined together with him, over 2,000 in total. They fought bravely on the Western Front. In trenches, in places like Artois, Champagne, Somme, and Verdun, Miguel was captured at Somme and held in Germany. Esos bastardos. When mi abuelita got the telegraph, she fell to her knees and recited a prayer to St. Leonard. I was determined to help Miguel, however I could, so I joined King Alfonso's elite committee. There were 40 of us, and we aided his majesty, el rey de España, however we could, as he acted as an intermediary between prisoners of war and their families. The king managed to get a hold of Miguel, and I was able to assure my abuelita that he was okay. When I was in the king's service, I learned about our government's efforts to end the German Navy's use of submarines and the time we entered a small German force in Spanish Guinea. So, uh, I hate to interject, but what brings you guys to Brooklyn? I came for a business deal. I came to find love. I heard of this great place to get tattoos of uh, avocados. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I was just wondering if you guys were here for like a veterans meeting or something. No, not that. But what about you, Sven? Are you even a veteran? What did you do during this war? Well, that my brother died in! I remember the church bells ringing non-stop to signify the mobilization of the Swedish troops on August 2nd, 1914. Panic and fear washed over our country. I remember my mama in disbelief after hearing about the bad news over the radio. However, the very next day, the Swedish government declared neutrality. While there was much hatred for the war, there were also a lot of pro-German sentiments. In a secret meeting conducted by our foreign minister, Nut Wallenberg, we agreed to act benevolently towards the Germans. Though still remaining neutral, the most well-known pro-German figure of them all was Sven Hedin, who wrote pamphlets warning of the Russian enemy. We wanted to play both sides and defend our borders by controlling fairways and access to ports. Our leader, Hammerskold, advocated strict neutrality in the war and continued trade with Germany. However, this subjected us Swedes to the Allied naval blockade in the north, which brought hardships and inflation and shortages. Prices rose by 250% and unemployment rose as well. Our main exports, timber and iron, were on German and British contraband lists. We couldn't even afford necessities, like Swedish meatballs. <laughs> my meatballs. One of my cousins, Larson, was involved in the black market and always had the hookup, if you know what I mean. I myself was not part of the black market, but participated in many of the strikes. Down with the German scum! Allies forever! <laughs> the Allies and our people viewed our leaders' neutrality as a pro-German policy. But he saw this position as a necessary stance in order to maintain power in Europe and further strengthen it. I was not a fan of the policies of Hammerhold, but instead participated in the movement towards true parliamentary democracy. In 1917, our leader rejected a proposal for a common trade agreement with Great Britain. 
organized by brother of our Swedish foreign minister. I was angered by the actions taken by that evil hunger scold. Oh wait, let me explain to you what that means. It's a play on words of his name. Hammerskold is his name, and we added hunger there, so now it means hunger shield. We did not deserve this. Had this trade agreement been established, Sweden's economy would have been relieved. By March of that year, Hungerskold got what he deserved and was kicked out, finally. In October of 1917, Sweden's Social Democratic Party, Party finally won our first election, and my main man, Niall Eden, became Prime Minister. Shortly after, in May 1918, the negative relations with England were, were soothed when us Swedes agreed not to send ammunitions, guns, and other re-exports to Germany. During the war, there were certainly Swedes who joined, although their numbers were few. Hungerskold's army bill of 1914 doubled the size of the army, but most men remained unarmed. The few Swedes who actually volunteered fought for the Germans on the Eastern Front against Russia or with the Whites in the Finnish Civil War. Germany, Germany, Uber Alexa. German wine, German woman, German song. The Merchant Marine suffered the most. My childhood playmate, Johansson, was one of the 700 Swedish sailors who lost his life at sea. Throughout the war, Sweden kept its neutral status, but there were obviously pro-German feelings in the government and among the people. And the rest is history. Ay Dios mio. Would you like something stronger? Yes. This one's on me. Hey, me too? Yeah, man. Let's just be thankful the war is over, yeah? Yeah, see. Aye. Too late. Hey, wait, can I see your IDs?